Hey everyone, and welcome to The Rational Republican, a podcast where we look at complex issues facing us here in Oregon and around the nation. We'll try to address issues from a nonpartisan perspective and view our disagreements through a lens of respect rather than tribalism or divisiveness. I'm James Ball. This is Nick Kurlaski. Hey listeners, how we doing? Today's podcast is brought to you by ProLift Garage Doors. ProLift is your one-stop shop for residential and small commercial garage doors from openers, springs, and rollers to full reinstalls. They offer same-day service on all garage door repairs with no extra charge for evenings or weekends. Serving the greater Portland metro area, call today and set up your free estimate at 503-558-6349 or at proliftdoors.com slash Portland. Again, that's 503-558-6349. 6349 or proliftdoors.com slash Portland. On this episode of the podcast, we're honored to welcome Mr. Jeff Stone. Jeff has been in and out of Oregon politics for most of his adult life and is currently the executive director of the Oregon Association of Nurseries. So he's got a lot of uh, agricultural experience. So um, Jeff, why don't you just take two minutes and uh, tell you who you are and, and how you got here? I know you worked for Senator Packwood for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm a Oregon native, grew up in Eugene, and uh, with two Democrat parents. Go Ducks. Uh, go Ducks. Yep. Uh, no. I'm, 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 we're going to start this off right. Um, I made it 20 but, seconds but, without a beaver plug. But, but my but my best friend was a beaver, and uh, so we played the Oregon fight song on his way down from our wedding uh, with my beaver <laughs> sister-in-law. So, uh, it's, it's all good. Uh, so I, I grew up in Eugene, uh, uh, really became more politically active with the Reagan revolution. So, uh, I, I saw, um, Watergate. I saw how Gerald Ford had pardoned. Wasn't quite sure. Then that race in 1980, I was a Bush person initially, uh, but really liked how Reagan you know, I know he scared some people, but his messaging was one of uh, big tent inclusion, and that that appealed to me. Uh, so I went to uh, the University of Oregon uh, and uh, was a political science major there. And Jim Klonoski, who was the Democrat um, uh, committee chair for Lane County, was one of my political science uh, professors. And he says, all right, Mr. Stone. Let's hear from the right wing today. And so every day he would pick on me. But he also wrote a letter of recommendation to my then boss after, at, after school was uh, Senator Bob Packwood. And he goes, I don't agree with anything that Jeff says, but he can critically think. And so then, you know, and I started at the bottom. Uh, with Packwood's office. I worked in the Oregon office. They offered me to go to DC and we were, we were, we were um, formed a little differently like most offices. Oregon uh, staff would have a lot more input on DC policy because Packwood was convinced that people got DC thick and we're only thinking about, you know, what they were seeing inside that bubble and it needs to always reflect home. And so there was a lot, and the one thing that you would never do is make a mistake and he would have to, if he went onto the floor and he made, you made a mistake, um, you would be fired. Uh, you can forgive an error in judgment, but never one in fact. And I have carried that throughout my entire uh, career. So I worked for uh, Senator Packman for eight years. In fact, I was the one who turned out the light at the end when he had resigned and we were we had closed the office. Um, that was a really unique uh, experience. Um, the Packwood staff are virulently loyal. Um, the Packwood and Hatfield staff are very different from one another. Uh, Hatfield staff likes to be liked. We like to fight. And sometimes you need both. I mean, so there's no one, or, you know, because you, you have to be bipartisan. That's what Senator Packwood taught me. But for eight years, I worked for him. Uh, but when you resign, you can be a little radioactive. And so it was, it was hard. But then one of my deep, dark secrets is I became chief of staff at Metro, the mm -hmm. regional government. Um, talk about a stranger in a strange land. But John Kavistad, who ran for state treasurer as a Republican, hired me. And we changed the very nature of how that organization was formed. Uh, it was very dysfunctional, uh, and we were able to change that. So there would be a Metro Council president, then 
counselors. There was an executive director who had in charge of the 500 staff and then like the council. Well, that was more than even odds for me uh, because a lot of those folks had never really encountered a political being, especially one that was raised uh, uh, by Senator Packwood. Um, and so after that, um, you know, I, I went through and we got through uh, an election to have the new uh, Metro president in. And then um, Rod Park, who was a Metro counselor, uh, a nurseryman out of Greshman, uh, said, you should think about the OAN. I go, what's, what's the OAN? Those are the people that come in and cry about us paving their land. And uh, he goes, well, we can do better. And I said, you need to do better. And so I was hired as their government relations uh, director. I actually followed Mark Simmons. Mark Simmons, who was the Speaker of the House, a controversial hire for the association. And a person that we both know, John Gary, who's now down at the Wine Growers Association in California, hired me. Uh, well, he left to go to the Wine Growers, and I asked him to do a national search. Uh, do a national, I don't want you to always think that grass is greener in New York. So I've been the executive director for 11 years, been at OAM for 15, and I don't know plants. I know I kill them. I'm a good customer. Uh, but they always said that. Yeah, they said, we don't, we can teach you the green side, but you, what we want is your clarity of thought, your vision. And that's what I've been trying to do since then. And so I bring a unique perspective that I was not raised in agriculture, uh, but I made the machine to pave them over. I also know how to disconnect it. So, so uh, all, all, all skills that I think have been very interesting. We, we, we don't shy away from hard issues. I mean, transportation infrastructure, you can see the flatlining of people's eyes glaze over for that, but it's very important to get product mm -hmm. to market. Um, uh, a controversial issue like immigration and immigration reform. Uh, we worked with non-traditional partners to pass the driver's license bill. And then it went to the ballot, got thoroughly demolished there and we came the driver's back. license bill was to give um people Undoc undocumented, undocumented immigrants a, a, a license yeah. yeah it was really it was really i mean while while agriculture is predominantly uh immig uh, immigrant workforce right. that wasn't the predominant reason it was really more of a safety issue for us that you want people who are licensed and able to drive on the road and uh, and so a lot of the rules that governed immigration had changed over the last 10 years. So people are more stationary. Uh, so that's why it was important. Um, and then you, you talk about any issue, we're probably in the middle of it. Climate is one. Interestingly, um, nurseries export plants and trees. And so then we wonder why, you, why would you put a regulatory structure in that increases transportation and natural. We said natural gas was good for so long. Now, why is it evil? Yeah. So uh, the, we, we touch on a lot of issues. We have a lot of ground that we could cover, but that's that's me in a nutshell. I've been I've led at the national level. We can talk about how we kept markets open during covid um, with uh, and we there's I've been the president of our national nursery uh, execs um, and that that's that was really gave me a really nice perspective about not only national politics, uh, you know, through this that state colleague vision but also all the um canadian provinces so i'll stop there yeah well so it's, it's definitely a, a great start to a, a bio there and I, there's a lot of different you know avenues that i really want to go down i get to start out with i'd, I'd be kind of curious for your thoughts you you obviously you, you cut your teeth at a very young age you know starting at the very bottom of you know of bob packwood's office and now you so you've worked for united states senator worked for metro council here and now you've worked for uh, the largest the largest NGO. sector of ag yeah, yeah, definitely working with the politicians right. at a federal and state level. Are you a are you a by nature political person and that makes you successful at the job that you have, or are you successful at the job that you have and that by nature that necessitates that you stay involved and stay on top of everything that's happening at the political world? Yes. <laughs> but I would I would say that um uh Ronald Reagan and that whole uh time and period uh, lit the match for me uh, for uh, political involvement. I was mm -hmm. fascinated how things worked. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm a historian of the presidency and of the Supreme Court, so I'm just curious about the machinery. The Senate operates very differently than the House. I always appreciated the Senate more because it was more deliberative, um, not governs. I mean, I already have a problem governing my emotions on issues, but to be a House member, that means you just blab it all the time. Mm -hmm. the, the Senate should be more um, considered. It's also that cools the tea. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, I think that my political appetite has helped. I was I certainly think that that's why I was hired initially mm -hmm. and with the ability to build coalitions. And I learned from Senator Packwood quite early that you should argue all day long and then afterward go have a beer with them because you don't burn a bridge because six months from now you may need them on th something that you both have not come across yet. And his best friend was Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the Democrat from New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I've taken that lesson to heart. Um, and I've used that kind of bipart. I, I have a membership uh, that spans a great divide. We have growers, greenhouse, we have retailers. So politically speaking, we're probably 60, 40 Republican. Mm -hmm. um, but it has to, it forces us to chart a centrist path. So how do you then become effective politically? Well, that's become solution oriented. So it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. If your ideas are worthy, we will pursue them. If they are not, we will oppose them. And sorry if we're not pure. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's interesting. I mean, that's come up several times. You know, the the big tent from Reagan, the the bipartisanship of of uh, Senator Packwood, and um, I think that's something that we're severely lacking in 2021 is the bipartisanship, the um, bringing people together, and getting a little bit off topic, but we do that a lot here. Um, there is no topic to get on. I, I'm starting on, to see, I'm starting to see like, I mean, this whole last four years, the Trump presidency, I was so frustrated with the demeanor coming out of the white house and just the, the just blatant disregard for anything that doesn't agree with the man in charge. And then Biden comes in and he says all of these great things about how we're going to be, you know, he's going to be the president for all of America and we're going to be united and then goes and passes the most partisan, controversial, nasty executive orders. Um, I'm, start I'm starting to see the appeal of Trump a little bit, to be honest, uh, because he says, I'm going to be a, a, a partisan D-bag. And then he went and was a partisan guy. And then, but, but it, it, I can see now the, the leadership now seems to be saying all the right things. And then they're just as partisan as Trump was. They just don't, they're just not honest about it. They, they say the, uh, the exact opposite of what they're doing. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, and I think that's a, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and don't let don't let Sorry. me forget about no no don't let me forget about uh, kind of Trumpism uh, because that's its own kind of sure. category for me. Um, Barack Obama used the executive order as a way to not legislate, but through an uh, administrative fiat, uh, advance goals, uh, and you know he had a very hostile. Republican Congress, and I and I get that, but we we were long in the tooth criticizing this pre, uh, President Obama for not running things through a legislative process instead of just using your pen through an executive fiat. So that the guy the die was cast, um, and then you came came a president who wanted to do things differently. I mean, I was intrigued to see how he would govern. I, sure. I found I found his behavior repugnant, still do. Mm -hmm. Not not the office to me has a uh, a reverence that you see with George W. Bush. You see it has the past presidents gather um, about the reverency that the office is more than the person. Mm -hmm. And so we we lost that. Um, and I, I agree with you that President Biden, in his desire to try to right wrongs, has gone into the executive order um, uh, pile and just dizzy. It's like 55 or something like that is the record. I think he's passed it. Um, and some of it is not things I would object to politically. 
you know, the border wall, things like that, things mm -hmm. that are distractions. Right. Um, but it's not a substitute for legislating. And a man who is a product of the Senate, Senator Paquin has high regard for the intellect of Joe Biden. He said people who underestimate him do so at their peril because he's a smart man. And I just I, I agree with you that using that apparatus is maybe expedient in the moment, but I think it continues a bad practice that the la now the last three administrations has availed themselves of. So that's I'd actually I'd be really curious for your thoughts on that. It, you uh, as somebody who's who was uh, a former Bush person who worked for a United States senator and you know is a is a student of the Supreme Court, the 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 jostling and the the jockeying for for poll position between the three branches of government has always been of interest personally to me, and that's kind of been one of my thoughts is a sense of the. George W. Bush worked, I thought, very well with Congress, which was admittedly uh, Republican for six of his eight years. But he even uh, he passed TARP through a, a Nancy Pelosi led Democratic Congress in the final two years of his presidency, uh, as well as another other a number of other key pieces of legislation. But I feel that under the Obama administration and certainly continuing through Trump and now Biden, the the executive has really exerted its authority while Congress has kind of wallowed in this continual bickering and there's very few impactful things that have come out of the United States Congress. Do you feel that, I mean, first off, do you agree? And second off, do you feel that there's kind of any end game for that where Congress can kind of reassert and get itself back on equal footing? Well, I think there's that opportunity now, uh, especially after the insurgency to try to re you know, to level set. Mm -hmm. But I'll go back to what James said. Um, you know, people don't compromise anymore. Compromise actually mm -hmm. is a dirty word. And I think this is a direct result, the symptom of that lack of cooperation. It, going across the aisle is frowned upon. Mm -hmm. I talked with Senator Jeff Merkley. I go, Senator, why don't you do it more? And I've known him since he was the state in the state house and, and speaker. Mm -hmm. And he goes, actually, people keep track. If I go and talk to Senator Thune, for too long, they wonder what I'm talking about. We're talking about mm -hmm. kids, mm -hmm. you know, and, but that tells you the level of toxicity that, you know, has really rendered itself. And, and this president, you know, um, uh, President Trump, you know, really degraded where that center line is, uh, you know, and I'm a Republican. I've been since I've registered to vote. But I find myself on the tippy edge of liberalism, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the party now. And I, I mean, I was always pro-choice, pro-gun, you know, you know, pro-gay marriage. You know, it's about individualism. Sure. But without You're on the right podcast, then. <laughs> but without 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 accountability, individualism, you know, it it, it gets harmed. Mm -hmm. So people can think that, I mean, people used to, I mean, what was the old adage? Um, don't, uh, uh, don't have people, I mean, people will think you a fool unless you open your mouth and remove all doubt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have way too much of that where, I mean, you saw it with the insurrection. People are videotaping that. I mean, they're, they're going selfies and then they said, oh, I don't, I shouldn't be prosecuted. <laughs> there, there was, uh, I saw some, some videos of people walking past the Capitol police as they're walking through the Capitol, breaking the law, telling the Capitol Police how much they appreciate them and the sacrifices that they're making. They're just like, do you guys not see what's what you're doing? It, it, it's yeah, and, and this is strange. something that will divide us. Like, I mean, like the Vietnam War, perhaps. Uh, you know, I wasn't around. Um, I mean, I was around, but I had a lot of hair and, um, <laughs> and young. But, you know, I, I, I look at the fissures that have um, been created within the Republican party. And it does not help that the party itself, you know, aligned itself with censure of the, of the folks who voted for uh, impeachment. Um, where is it about ideas now? And that's okay. what, and, and to, that's the root of, you talk about the lack of ability to compromise, but the lack of ideas and critical thinking. And that's, that's why I think civics is something mm -hmm. that we should talk about because people don't understand how their government works. There's so many on both the left and the right. I've seen it 
where they have started demonizing the other side. It's, it's the othering, it's the tribalism, it's the, it's, it's easier. Not, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And I think social media has a big part to play in these echo chambers where you go in there and you say, you, you've got your little tribe, your little group of people. And, you know, when I was running for state representative, I noticed that a lot. I would try to foster conversations. I would say stuff uh, on my Facebook page and it was, it was, it felt really good to say something partisan and get, you know, that positive feedback. (laughs) And, and and I would get called out sometimes by by my liberal friends and followers. And I had to, I had to stop myself and, and it just, it, 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 you get a hit of dopamine when you say something extreme and it, and it resonates with people. Um, but you're right. You're right. It's about the ideas. And that's kind of what we've gotten away from. It's my ideas are better than your ideas. And let's talk about the, the ideas. But what we're doing now is if you don't agree with me or you're in the member of the opposite party, you are now an evil person and you are trying to destroy America. Well, and that and that's a long I mean, I ran for state rep in 92, uh, then House Majority Leader Greg Walden. Hmm. Uh, and then State Representative Kelly Clark asked me to run against Gail Shibley, who was the first openly gay uh, legislator. And I said, really? And they said, you're going to lose. I mean, you're not going to make it out of the primary. Um, but I need her to worry. And so it was interesting when I would go and, I t- and I'm pro gay rights. And they said, why are you running against Gail? Hmm. You know, why? I said, well, her spending's out of control, you know, all these different policies. She loves the government growing at 28% per year. Mm. How is that? I mean, how is that sustainable? How do we build jobs? Um, and it was, it was quite illustrated. When, when I went to the Republican party thing where they were now, you know, people could go up and do their two seconds. I got booed because I was pro-choice Ooh. <laughs> and Marty Kehoe yeah. was like a, like a, a, a builder. He goes, man, you had guts. I said, that's what I believe, right? I'm not saying that, you know, they're wrong. It's just what my belief system is. Yeah. So anyway, I thought I think that it gets to your point, James and, and Nick, that you know that that whole nomenclature of being able to work alongside is seen as weakness. And that when I in fact, I, the best legislation I have ever passed. Well, it's worse than that. It's not just weakness. It's, it's consorting with the enemy. Yes. It's yeah. It, it, it's compromising your, your morality to go talk with the other side. That that's what it is. So I'll, I'll leave it. Then we can, we can switch gears that I would have a coffee with Tom Chamberlain from AFL CIO at the beginning of a session. And we had a bet. We would sit there and talk about whose group would talk to us first about what we're talking about. <laughs> who won you know and we we would we would argue tooth and nail on issues but we just wanted to play with our food and just see who would freak out and usually it was the aggies first <laughs> thinking well, that trade coat jeff <laughs> <laughs> there's there's your bumper sticker next time yeah, you run for Star right <laughs> right but i mean that was that was the ronald reagan tip o'neill is you know you, you're like you're like cats just going at each other. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, you're still two officials in high government office and you, you know, you, you enjoy each other's company. You get along, you sit down, you have a drink. And it's just like 30 years, well, 40 years ago now, that was, you know, that was a, a death knell. And, you know, it's, it's only gotten worse since then, but it's just like, why, why is this such a problem? I mean, I, and I, longtime listeners, first off, God bless you if there are any longtime listeners, but longtime listeners of the podcast, my my soapbox is I think cable news is is the worst thing to ever come out and that that's the thing that allows it to amplify if you're Rachel Maddow and you can say Jeff he has Jones. enormous she has enormous hands is that right <laughs> oh, huge bits <laughs> that it's like shaking things, hands with me would like be Andre the Giant <laughs> I never would have imagined that about Rachel I'm, Maddow I'm, but <laughs> you you will now for the day. <laughs> There you go. Rachel Maddow, please come on your pod uh, on the podcast and we'll shake hands with you. But 
that you know what what used to be just a thing you know maybe you'd read about it in the newspaper or something but now it gets amplified on fox news and msnbc and now twitter and facebook and instagram and it's just you know rather than say yeah i sat with a a, a democrat and we talked for you know two or three hours about really good ideas and really good stuff that we want to get done all people are going to see is there's a picture of you know an r and a d and it's just you know this guy's not one of us we need to go primary him in the next election and it's just like what is this? What are we doing? You lose here? the support of your base because you know, you know, both. I mean, both sides are the same in that they're always looking for an excuse to fight, and like a lot of the bases are. And so, if you lose support of your base, the other side's not going to take you in. And oh, so, that, that, that's exactly right. And you've got nobody, and so you've got to keep that base satisfied, or else you're gonna you're gonna be out of a job. It's it's crazy. Um, so. That was one so I mean, one 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 thing. I mean, I think people are too akin to just tailor their news streams, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that yeah. bubble is a real thing. Um, and I, I have good friends who go on to the you know the Epoch and you know the all those Net Daily. And, oh my yeah. goodness! And That's and I've news. gone on and I was going. Oh, you make the Washington Examiner seem like you're a liberal <laughs> rag. Yeah. And, but I mean, I would honestly, back when Megyn Kelly was at Fox on a big issue of the day, I would go, I would go in between to see how the news cycle was going to be presented. Mm -hmm. So Rachel Maddow and her enormous mitts with, (laughs) and then, um, and then, um, you know, on, on Fox and I, I found it fascinating, but then they got pure on each channel. Mm hmm. And so that, I mean, to me, that does not serve, especially with the weakness of the, of the printed paper now, um, you know, and people being able to look for things that maybe are not within their wheelhouse. It gets into how people understand the world that they live in. I honestly think that people who charge the capital don't understand how the government works. And I also don't think they probably voted. Well, I think a lot oh, of the right. leaders, are they, they, some of the more prominent figures, the guy with the buffalo headdress, and then there was the guy carrying the podium, those, and then there was like one other guy, but all three of them did not vote. One of them hadn't voted, uh, or two of them, I think, had not voted ever, and the other one has did not vote in either 20, 2016 or 2020, but had voted previously. I haven't missed them so, yeah. since I turned 18. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, he... I, I, don't duty, one, but, I don't get it. I don't get it. One mayoral yeah. runoff like a year ago. This is February of 25th, so like last May or whatever. It was between two very left candidates, and I think I skipped that one. But yeah, other than that, it's just like if you – I'm sorry, man. Like I, I'm not for compulsory voting. I don't want to make a law or anything. But if you don't vote, you have no right to to complain or to go protest or to do any of these things. It's just like you – you the one thing that you can do is open to all Americans over 18 years old. Like why are you not doing this? What is this? So well, interestingly, it's, uh, it's people are jaded, right? Yeah. So they they don't think that their vote matters. And mm-hmm. I can tell you, it, when races, we've worked on races that we've lost like by seven hundred votes. Every vote matters. Mm-hmm. Jeff Helfrich sure. lost a state house seat in you know thirty miles east of me yeah. by eighty four votes this past election. And it's just out of how yeah, we endorsed him. We yeah. endorsed him much against uh, Tina Kotek's wishes. Brian Sorry, Stout, who is uh, Northwest Portland, lost by 500 votes. Um, yeah. yeah, there there were several. Uh, Denise Boyles lost. Bowles. 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 Yep. Lost by. I, I said it wrong until she corrected me, which is a little bit more awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Senator. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we please vote for our bill. <laughs> one of the other things i was interested that. in getting your opinion on is uh we kind of talked a little bit by email about this beforehand is uh the immigration issue um the nurseries employ a lot of um i would guess migrant workers and so my very limited experience in this li- living downtown is i dated a girl who worked on a farm or her parents owned a farm at one point and getting to talk to them they were saying, you know, when they when they were kids, her parents, they would grow up picking strawberries in their neighbors, you know, their neighbors' farms. And you get paid by the box, and that's what you did all summer to make extra money. Now they said none of the none of the white kids want to do it. And so the only people that will they 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 bring in migrant workers to come pick strawberries and work the fields, um, because it, there's no one else to do it. Um and so, you know, they you have to jump through all the hoops to make sure everybody is legal and everybody has gotten the correct visas 
And if they can't jump through all those hoops and, you know, dot their I's and cross their T's, there's nobody to, nobody to pick the, the produce. Um, so they, they were very, the, the immigration issue uh, was, was very, uh, very front of mind to them when they were talking about politics. Um, so what, what are your thoughts? Um, and you sent us a couple uh, things that you had written, um, the different styles of visas. And I know there's, there's this is the oh, I, I, topic, you can get but, sucked into the black hole of all yeah. that. I, I can explain it pretty pretty simply for the, for the general audience. First of all, agricultural work um, doesn't have people flooding to it. So there is a labor crisis in agriculture. It doesn't matter if you are a strawberry producer, a cherry grower, a nursery operator, which is different where you're, where you're round. And so a lot of people like the craftsmanship of growing a plant. And so the difficulty with the immigration issue is that the worker might be legal and authorized to work, but his wife or his parents may not be. And so the trepidation and fear that is pervasive within that community is a real one. And, and President Trump amplified that. I mean, talk about spinal tap. He turned that one to 11, right? Nice. So do you like that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a lot of them. We could, spend a whole, <laughs> we, have a, we could spend a whole 45 minute segment, which I would enjoy uh, talking about this issue and diving, really going not wide, but deep into it. But let's, let's talk about how it's different than it was when our parents uh, were growing up. Uh, before you talked about migrant workers, that's how it exactly mm -hmm. was. People would go from, you know, state to state, you know, go up. You could literally see when I worked for Packwood, you could see the migrant workforce move up the coast depending on what was needed. Right. And the farmer would say, all right, James Ball, you said you're authorized. You have your driver's license. You have a license. You have all the things that are on an I-9 form. Your face is on that. And so, yes, okay. I mean, it's not like people, other people are beating down my door to work. Right. So, but if you came and said, now my name is Nick Perlosky with a different social security number, I have to terminate you as an employer mm -hmm. because then I know you're undocumented. So the whole notion of immigration reform and getting a visa system that supports the American worker. I mean, it's not like when the H-2A, which is the agricultural visa, you have to demonstrate you can't get the workers hmm. before you can get those 35 employees. It's not going to solve your problem, right, for your total workforce, but you have to be in from, say, March 1st to July 1st, right? That's the visa duration. Let's say, like it was this year, weather was unpredictable. So I really need you in February, mm -hmm. but then you, you arrive in March and then I don't need you in June, but you still have to pay. I mean, it's very rigid. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a, there's a better way to do it. In fact, when we go to Congress, we talk about the elements, no longer about citizenship. A lot of people, I would, I'd venture to guess that Many folks just want to be authorized. They don't necessarily want citizenship. They just want to be have adjusted status so they are legal here to work. That's what Reagan did. That's what Reagan did, and that was called amnesty, which is now a dirty word. But what they didn't do was two years later, which I was there for, when Congress took a pass on the visa system that was supposed to come after, and it hit the reset button. So now we have a bunch of people who are undocumented, who have no other choice. Um, and it, you can, we can do better. It's been a political football by both sides. Both sides have, have larceny in their heart uh, for this issue. Hmm. And I, this is somewhat related to this, I, I'd be curious for your thoughts on one of the other things that I, I, I saw that you had written about previously was the the increase in uh, American kids in going to college and looking for jobs that require higher education, obviously, you know, going through putting themselves into debt. And, and I would, this in tandem with, you know, all of the issues surrounding immigration, uh, I would wager has a, a massive effect on, on a lot of industries, yours included, but American kids don't want to do manual labor anymore. American kids want to, you know, sit behind a computer and do pivot tables in Excel. 
Yeah, that, I don't think I, anybody that, wants to do pivot table. Like, <laughs> just, just throwing that out there. Just, I, I think that's a hard one to, to cross. But, uh, you know, it's the iPad, iPod uh, generation, iPhone, gener- the i generation. Yeah. Um, and I don't blame them. I mean, my, my, I, I don't begrudge families who want to have their kids. Mine are going to be a teacher and a nurse, right? I'm proud of that. They're yeah. going to get a four-year degree to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't begrudge them that they didn't want to go into agriculture, uh, but you're right um, that the way of normalcy of having people have that experience has gone. And you know, I I did a day of work. You may have signed that my day with Jose. Yeah, was a column. Two um, days. Yeah, um, you know, I was arguing with Lars Larson. Uh, and wanted him to come out and just see walk in the shoes of the people he was criticizing. Then I realized I hadn't done it myself. Hmm. So I did. I went out there. Uh, the one in winter, I just tried not to cut my fingers off as we were trimming Paris hmm. on a 19 degree day. The second one was, I think you read that I we were planting rhododendron in a field. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my line looked like I had feel, failed a field sobriety test. <laughs> and it was so bad. And the workers guys who were older than me passing me going back and i realized i'd see one kind of peel off they were going behind me to fix it <laughs> they really thought i was going to be a like a photo op because i was the exec they didn't real and i said i want to be treated just like everybody so i learned about their families learned how you know how their homeowners and how they sent their kids to college and you know and how hard work matters and i go why why would republicans vilify hard work and they're extremely religious mm-hmm, mm-hmm. men and women of god right and so uh, a strong moral fiber but yet this history has a history of this my friends i mean uh, the germans are going to ruin america when abraham lincoln it was the yellow curse dur- mm-hmm. for the asian americans during tr it was the germans and the italians during fdr so who's next up in the queue who haven't right. we, we should, who haven't we demonized yet? What do we right. do? Oh, Mexico's right there. Let's demonize Mexico. Let's demonize Central. Well, it'll Mexico. be some it'll be somebody else in you know 20 years, which shows that we don't learn. Yeah. Well, and I, so I uh, I grew up in El Paso. I spent middle school and high school in El Paso, Texas, which is from here to the wall behind me, away from the border with Mexico. And it was it was the third safest city in the country. They did a, they did a great job at keeping crime rates low and you know, everybody go along to get along. I've been and, drunk in El Paso at an Oregon bowl game. Not that Oregon State's familiar with that. <laughs> you went to you went to one of the the uh, the Sun yes. Bowls down there. Oh yeah, against Minnesota, it was terrible. Uh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> I actually I worked with a guy who played halfback in that game or fullback in that game, and um and I remember Sorry. I looked it up and yeah, I had to get my Minnesota cheap shot. Was, in. <laughs> it was no, Minnesota was so was, was dominant. Yeah, well, they had the barbers. They had bar. They had barber. He was one of the running backs, and then you know they were good. They, yeah, sure, sure enough. No, I uh, honestly, there's probably a better than 50% chance I was at that game because that was late 90s, early 2000s, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's that's Helen when Clemens I was, down was there. the quarterback. Yeah, there you go. But, um, I can't do math, but I know that <laughs> it's one of those like it's all it's all related somehow. I can't I can't sum two numbers in my head, but if you give me a football number or whatever, I'll figure it out. Amen. But, um, so that was obviously like a, a huge concern there. Border security was, was a major thing. And, you know, it was always in the papers. It was, you know, like once a week, somebody would get caught, you know, hopping over one of the walls or whatever. And, you know, the, the white people that I knew, which is very few because El Paso is like 80 or 90% Hispanic, but you know, a lot of these, you know, folks had moved from other parts of the country and they were like, they would be up in arms. And then you'd go and look and, you know, they'd have a Hispanic house cleaner or they, you know, go to restaurants that, you know, they'd get really good burritos and quesadillas and stuff that they were knowingly made by people who had just come over for the day, come over to work. And it's like the, the amount of hypocrisy there, the amount of unself-awareness that, that is, is needed to, to kind of, you know, rationalize those two things and put everything together is just, is mind boggling to me. Well, I think what it does, fear, oh, sorry, go ahead. oh, no, I just going to say playing, <clears throat> not even really devil's advocate, but just trying to like, one of the things I always try to do when I disagree with somebody is try to understand where they're coming from. And I think that it, on the immigration issue, a lot of times it's sort of a, it's sort of become a morality thing almost where it's like, you have to follow the rules and do the right thing and go through the right steps. And 
if you're not doing those things, you're breaking the rules and you're not. And, and so I think that's, that's kind of where it, where it comes from is, is this morality of, if you're not following the rules, then why should we give you any sort of special treatment? Um, but to all of your points that, that totally just ignores the humanity of it. Well, I mean, and, and James, you're not wrong. I mean, when I would yeah. debate this issue, I would say my friends on the right, the people who are virulently anti-immigrant, I mean, I mean, disturbingly so, right. they're not wrong on wanting people to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. The problem is if the system, though, is so reprehensibly broken that they have no ability to. Because if you if you just put everybody through uh, that's undocumented now through the normal channels, it would take eight years for the State Department to process them all. So how is that helpful? Um, and so but we should we should not let that be a barrier uh, and fear fear is a really good motivator. I mean, and America's changing. The minority is going to become the majority by 2030. So, I mean, I, I, I my kids, um, we, we went to, uh, we, uh, I raised my kids in Southwest Portland and Markham Elementary has a 70% free and reduced lunch program. Wow. And so that's, I mean, seriously, kids in need. It also is right near where the mosque was, where the, set, mm. the Portland Seven were. Mm. And the level of fear for Arab Americans was real. And all my daughters would say is that that's, you know, that's uh, this girl's name. And she taught me how to tie a kajab. And it was, is that threatening? No, no. Oh, but, but I'm saying that fear, fear is the easiest path. We talked a lot about what's easy today. Yeah. Fear is an easy path. And well, you, and I, I get in that, that sort of feedback loop and, and other people who kind of just amplify it. And yeah, you know, one of the things that um, has really struck me doing this podcast is uh, we, we met with Dr. Dr. Satya Chandragiri, Chandragiri, um, gosh, near the beginning of the podcast, yeah, it was like a year and a half years ago. ago yeah. Um, but he <laughs> said, <veterans>. something, <laughs> but he's, so he's, uh, he's chairman of the Salem school board right now. Um, at the time he was a candidate, but uh one of the things that he said that has stuck with me this year and a half is nobody comes to America to be a, to bleach off the system. And he, he said it probably more, more eloquently than that, but he's like, everybody who comes here comes here because they want to work hard. They want a better, better life for themselves and their families. Nobody comes here to get on welfare and sit around and do nothing. So we, as the Republican party, there's an opportunity here with these immigrants who want to work hard, who want to keep their money. I mean, if we just message to them that, you know, we are the party of individual liberty and we are the party of, of allowing you to pursue the American dream. And it's the Democrats who are trying to tax every nickel that you, that you earn and who are making you jump through all these hoops. Like there's a tremendous opportunity here to grow the Republican party. And we just need to embrace that. And anyway, it's, I have to go listen to that episode again, because I forget exactly what he said, but it was, it, it, it's a really good point. And then, you know, I think immigrants can be held to a higher standard. Um, you know, they have to pass a citizenship chat test. 93% of those folks who take the test pass it. I did a little beta test with people that we know. Um, and my own staff, my Facebook, you know, hive mind to take the citizenship chest. Well, generally over a third of the Americans who would have to take the 20 question test fail. My staff was 20%. Only, uh, only 20% passed. Yeah. Only 20% passed. Passed. Wow. Uh, well, 33% Past. That's I, I had it inversed nationally. Oh, sure. Uh, and the Facebook hive mind was better at forty percent, but barely for passing. But that's I, mean, less I, than I got I got the... I got twenty out of twenty because you know I'm intellectually <laughs> superior to all you. Well, it's it's people don't even know the three branches. <laughs> well, of yeah, the bottom. You know, I, I, that was a good. Point. How many how many Supreme Court justices are there? Yeah. Right. Not hard, man. Right. Stuff that, yeah. Well, not according to Biden. Biden's going to increase it to 15. So. Right. I was going to say, yeah. We're, we're, we're I'm about comforted today, by or... that. <laughs> He's going to change the answer to that. Well, so it's it's funny because I, I remember 
I, I was, you know, 12 or 14 or something like that. And there was a stand up comedian. And part of his routine was you don't see people like beating down the doors to to go emigrate to Mongolia or emigrate and and go right, to because there's enough bones on the roads out there yeah, exactly you know like i na- na- gave a couple of different countries and it's like we're here in america like this is the price we pay for being the best country in the world everybody else if you're not here everybody else wants to come here to work and to earn a living and to believe your beliefs and to support your family and to do the things that you want to do and this it, it's a little bit reminiscent because like I'm to an extent, I'm like a, a, a Duralex said Lex guy, like the law is harsh, but it is the law. And if you if you're an immigrant, and you come here illegally, you've broken the law. Like there's no ways around it. If I drive 66 miles an hour on the highway, I broke the law. There's no two ways about it. But this is when, you know, the last couple of months, Donald Trump got up on cable news and on Twitter and everything. And he kept telling everybody, every, you know, the election is rigged. The election is fixed. They're going to throw it for, for Joe Biden. They're not going to let me win. And then it, on January 6th, as they were certifying the results, as the insurrection was starting, there were senators making the argument that they said, well, look, 30, 38 percent of Americans believe that the election was stolen. We need to dig into this. And it's like, well, you can't falsely you know imbibe them with those ideas and then turn around and say well look they believe this now it's the same thing with our immigration system we can't make the laws so strict and so harsh that the only way you come here is by doing so illegally and then turn right around and and vilify and demonize and ostracize the people who do choose to come here because it's like well look at this they broke the law the answer obviously to to me i think to all three of us on this podcast is that the system needs to be rethought. Immigration reform needs to happen. And it needs to happen in such a way that allows for the people who do want to come here, who do want to do a jobs that, you know, younger American, you know, college kids, whatever, don't want to do. And instead, we just, we play political football with an issue that's very important to a lot of different people and a lot of different parts of the economy of this country. Yeah. I, I, there's hardly anything I could disagree with there. And and being in a room with folks who are actually writing the laws, that discussion can happen, right? But once it gets outside of that office, it gets metastasized. Mm-hmm. And, and then it becomes a problem. And uh, here's the one thing that I will say that inflames. I mean, not the one thing. I probably said 18 things. Uh, <laughs> um, but we're only talking about a Southern Wall. And why is that? Only talking, only talking about what? Southern wall. Yeah. To the country. Why? Because their skin color is different from ours. Yeah. And culture, you're seeing, and you're seeing, culture is different. Yeah. I mean, Canadians are very nice. We don't need a wall. I love them. They gave, they gave us hockey, <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm cool with it, but. Won my fantasy but, hockey league last week. Yes. Good for you. <laughs> um, I, my, my daughter asked for a Satan jersey and wanted to wear it to church. Is that and right? I, yes. <laughs> so I said, eh, maybe, maybe we should not do that. Uh, but my, my, my point being is that that's a distraction. My very bringing that up is a distraction to the real purpose of trying to have a system that can grow with the economy recede when there's a recession uh, and just go go with that way. I mean, that that's what we're after. That's what the nurseries are trying to do. We're working with anybody that will work with us on that. And I, I, just, I just think that that whole issue is worthy of your attention because it's one that has perplexed 30 years plus, um, you know, the Congress and our society, because Oregon tries this, what happens is when the federal side doesn't do it right, states think that they should do it. All states can do is hurt me. All states can, they can't, they can't grant visas. Mm. Um, They, all they can do is put regulations on. They can't help me with my problem. So I have offered the most conservative Republicans in our legislature said, come to DC with me, help me solve it. Yeah, no, it's, a talk, it's a talking point. And it's it, it, it just ends up being such a shame. And it's uh, and obviously such a, a hindrance to the work that you do. And I, I, I guess I'd be curious to talk a little bit more about that, just because you are 
you're obviously in this, the crossroads of working in industry and working in politics, but the work that you do in the industry is very, is, is very Oregonian in nature. It's, it's really something that, you know, can not only happen here, but can, can really only happen here to the, to, to the volume that it does. So you get a good cross section of what it's like to be political, but also what it's like to be an Oregonian. And for somebody like me, who's, I, I've been here for five and a half years now, I'm, I still consider myself an outsider looking in. Yeah. We'll, we'll it, adopt you. <laughs> even though I'm a beaver fan. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I'll take it. Not a but, husky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As long, as long as I'm not a husky, we're going to we all a husky have a line. <laughs> that's I think that's exactly right. No, no purple in this house. <laughs> but I, I mean, what's what's the future like for for nurseries? What's the future like for agriculture here in Oregon? And I, and I think at a, at a 30,000 foot level, how does Oregon get back to kind of its place as a, you know, as a as a leader in, in industry, as a leader in commerce, as a leader uh, an economic leader? And then, you know, how can how can we turn into a, a political leader? You know, we don't have the political footprint that we did when, you know, Mark Hatfield and Bob Packwood were in the Senate. It's a really good question. And I, I think that there are a lot of things that we can take solace, that you can take solace in with how traded sector nurseries are a billion dollar industry. Um, 75% of what we grow goes outside of the state, 50% east of the Mississippi. So it gives wow. you a sense of its breadth. We, you know, we, we go to uh, the, the, the Pacific Rim is a big trading partner. Canada, still a foreign country, um, is a big trading country um, uh, partner. Um, so there's a lot of good things that are happening there economically. Oregon is a leader in how they prop, you know, in terms of food production and nursery production. Wine has gotten its legs underneath it. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's affirming that that type of hard work and handshake agreement, which is ultimately Oregonian too. I mean, that's, I think it's very farmer that you're as good as your word. Handshake is good enough for me. So I think that is, those are all elements of an economy that um, people are aging out. Nick, um, you know, 72, I think 72 years old is the average age now for a farmer wow. and people are not wanting to get in it. So like my kids, um, you know, if I was stone farms, want to do something else. And so what happens to that once, a, once land is converted into housing or another purpose, um, you know, the, thing, the next great thing that makes widgets, um, you lose that land. And then there's food security. I mean, do you really want to be getting all your produce from Mexico? It has far different uh, food safety standards or somewhere else that maybe they grow it near a nuclear plant. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, you'll look glowing, but for a bad reason. Um, <laughs> but I, I, would, I, would, I would say that we've talked to some of my members about, you know, why not elective office? You're grounded, you're a Republican. Uh, you're solution oriented, but you have to raise so much money now for a job that is thankless. Mm -hmm. And we, so when you get into the state legislative side, that that's a, a true barrier. We have pe plenty of people who are on school boards, who are on fire, you know, part of the volunteer fire force, uh, fire, mm -hmm. firefighting force. Um, so their roots, I mean, not to have a, pun but their roots are deep but why make the sacrifice of taking time away from your livelihood to go into a cesspool where you're wrong mm -hmm. you get called out publicly and berated and everybody's yeah. all you know, everybody's that Prolosky, and... he 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 likes drug runners and people who murder people um be, because you're pro-immigration well yeah. no no, every chance we've said, we said people who are criminals, they should be deported. The problem is that the, it's so porous that that person can come back. You have to you know, deport people four or five times. And is that good? No. No, the system is broken. We're trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. But you can't fix it while getting pummeled mm -hmm. on every side. The liberal side wants to unionize them. The conservative side wants you know, them to wait 25 years to feed their family. Yeah. And I'm telling you, I mean, I have, I have two daughters. There's nothing I wouldn't do to feed my family. If that meant illegally immigrating to Mexico, 
in order to feed my family, I would do it in a heartbeat. Uh, we we had been in El Paso for like four years, and I, we were just the the four of us: my mom, my dad, my brother, and I. We're driving, uh, you know, just up the street, just through houses, residential, you know, on our way back home, and out of nowhere, it says, you know what? I don't blame those folks in Mexico. I'd want to be here too. And you know, we just we kind of chuckled. It's like, oh yeah, you know, that's funny. It's great. And you stop and think about that for a second, and it's just like absolutely if I, if I had no opportunity and I knew that there were opportunities aplenty to do what I mean any of a million different things that yeah, a lot of Americans don't don't want to do or think is beneath them or whatever but if I can work hard and make an honest living and you know come home to a roof over my head at the end of the day versus the alternative that you don't have in your country it's just like of course of course that's what's going to happen I day in day out year in year out like you you'd be crazy not to recognize that. Well, and the transitory nature of, of the immigrant workforce, as we discussed earlier, is not as mobile anymore. I mean, you'll have people go from a nursery to a Christmas tree operation during big time Christmas tree harvest. But that's usually when things are slower at the nursery. Um, but people no longer have that migratory um, uh, pattern. They, people, they're in our community. And so they want to put down roots. Mm -hmm. They're at your church. They're at your school uh, fundraiser. And it's just, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a complex issue where people on both sides are a little bit wrong, but they're also a little bit right, which comp it really makes it hard to find that compromise word because then you have sold out, yep. you know, and, you know, and now, now you're getting primaried. <laughs> yes, right. There's no, no two ways about it. All right. Well, so we've we've come up towards to the end of our time. Obviously, uh, viewers and listeners can see Jay, it's already the end of James's time. I think his computer died or something, so he's gone. Yeah, he was um, frozen. At least it wasn't like. Yeah, exactly. At least it was a normal pose. Yeah. <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> but I we we end every show by asking the guest who their favorite Republican is. So I, you know, national or here at the state, living or dead, anything you'd like. But I, who who's a you know a Republican that you draw on as a, as a leader, as somebody inspiration, anything like that? Well, I mean, Lincoln's always the first step. I mean, I, I have volumes of of how he conducted himself. But I'll I'll go a different route. Uh, Jack Kemp. Okay. Jack Kemp, who used Republican ideals to talk about poverty, to talk about economic growth, to to uh, say that Democrats are not evil, we need to work together. Um, you know, he really mended at a time that there was a lot of racial disparity. Mm -hmm. He talked about, you know, he's been in a locker room with predominantly African American people, mm -hmm. and. What's the big deal? Shouldn't we talk about ideas and whether or not they rise or fall rather than other metrics that seem pretty shallow? So Jack Kemp is my answer um, just because I, I like, you know, his whole enterprise zones, you know, how, how to help cities from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I thought he would have been a phenomenal vice president uh, and would have been one of those legendary presidents of the United States. Uh, I, I could not could not agree more. I first off, I love the fact that he was a Steeler for a very brief period at the start of his career. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a Raider, so we're gonna, we have so many cross <laughs> yeah, tensions. Say, how do we even get you on? I don't know. know. <laughs> Wait, your father was terrible on this. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? But I know I Jack Kemp is obviously that's. I think I actually I gave that as an answer. Who's your favorite Republican? And that was the answer I gave. And one of my friends got mad at me because he he said that's that's always what I say. Nobody ever knows who Jack. Kemp is but I always want to say it's like I that's that's a great role model for sure and I more people should say it I, I I could not agree more I could not agree well I Jeff thank you so very much for your time I definitely think this was a fun one listeners will uh we'll catch you next time thanks for listening to the rational republican podcast your hosts are James Ball and Nick Perlosky the show today is brought to you by ProLift Garage Doors of Portland serving the greater Portland metro area for all your garage door installation and repair needs if you'd like to get in touch with the show, you can email us at james at jamesaball.com or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. 
You can find our episodes at jamesaball.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts.